Hey there, it's Olivia Savannah here from Olivia's Catastrophe and today I'm here to give you my June wrap up. I'm going to be telling you about all of the books that I read in June. I read seven books in June and it was definitely a month of quality over quantity. I really had an amazing reading month. I'll have content warnings in the description box below if that's something you would like to check out. And without further ado, let's get right down to the books. So one of the first books that I finished this month was Extremely Loud and Incredibly Close by Jonathan Saffron Foa and this one is one of the oldest books on my TBR. I'm working my way through them this year and this was next up. I've actually already seen the film before I read the book and this happens immediately after the events of 9-11 and we follow a young boy who has lost his father and is going through the grieving process when he finds a key with a mysterious envelope and he knows that it's got something to do with his father and he decides he's going to try and find what fits that key. And I mostly had a mediocre time reading this. It was probably my least favourite read of the month but it wasn't by any means a bad book and the reason why I struggled with this one is because I wish 50% of the book was cut out of it because the book is divided into two points of views. We have the young child who I mentioned who is grieving and then we get the story of his grandparents and their romantic relationship and their history and I did not see how those two things connected or came together and I don't believe that happened very very well. Mostly I was just caring about this boy and his grief and his journey trying to find what fit that key and I do think that the author didn't do a good job of meshing the two perspectives and therefore the grandparents perspective could entirely be cut out. The grandparents perspective was also one that was written in a very unconventional writing style way where it was it was just so strange and different and usually I appreciate that in books and I like it but to me it just felt overwritten and too wordy and it just took too long to get to the point of nearly every single one of their point of view chapters. Whereas the son's chapter, The Young Boy, it's written a bit more standard conventional fiction style but there are some quirky fun elements to it with pictures and photos that are thrown in and I liked what was done. I really liked his voice, he's an incredibly smart young boy but at the same time he's a bit obnoxious and he has some of the languagisms that young children have so I think that also really captured the childlike perspective well. I always love when authors do a very good childlike perspective. I will say that at some times this book showed its date and its time. It's got some language that we wouldn't consider the best way to describe people in there and I forgive it kind of a bit for when it was published but it also just was not my favourite thing and you can see that the boy is trying to work through some of his perceptions or his prejudices that he seems to already have which are very very interesting because it talks a bit about how parents prejudices have rubbed off on him but overall I thought it was a pretty good book it was just standard it's just not one that I'm gonna treasure and remember for a long time whereas I feel like the film had an impact on me because I immediately wanted to read this book after watching the film so I do think it's a simple case of I liked the film better than the book I read Death Note Volume 4 by Sugumi Oba and Takeshi Obata and this is the fourth book in the Death Note manga series and this was a five star read for me, a new favourite. So in this series, I'll summarise the whole series rather than this particular volume, we live in a world where these gods of death exist and they have a notebook and they write down your name in the notebook and that person dies. That's just how the gods work. However, one of these gods gets bored and drops his death note down to the earth and a teenager finds it, a very smart teenager who decides he's going to start meeting justice on criminals with this death note. But the police quickly are on his case and so starts the book and it goes on a very interesting psychological social commentary plotline from there where you've got the mythology element with the gods of death and all of the mythology around the death note happening, the police trying to find out who is doing this and the person who is doing it with some discussions on crime and punishment and the system and what is working there and what isn't working there and what is justice and who decides justice. The best way I like to describe this series is crime and punishment by Dostoevsky but it's a manga series and it's a bit more contemporary and it's a bit more approachable and it's got you know it's manga so it's got pictures and that's exactly why I love it. I also love it because there's two main characters 
and the way that these two main characters are on the same wavelength in terms of intelligence and therefore it heats up the dynamic of the chase and the tension between them it is so good. In this volume we are more introduced to a female character who has a big role in this storyline and this manga series I have to admit it does not have the best female representation and that is very disappointing and also the character we're introduced to is so annoying. She is such an annoying character and I remember when I watched the anime I did not like her at all but in this book I kind of respected her because I do have a thing for women who decide they want something and they use manipulation and they use everything that they possibly can to get what they want. Kind of like Bella Swan does and people dislike her but I respect her and I do think I respect this main character so even though I can see that she's annoying, I can see why people are aggravated by her, I had a very good time reading about her and also reading about the tension and the dynamic and the continued chase that I mentioned before. These books are just genius and I'm really looking forward to continuing the series. Up next we have Teaching My Mother How to Give Birth by Wilson Shire. If you watch some of my earlier wrap-ups you'll know that I read her recently published debut poetry collection Bless the Daughter Raised by a Voice in Her Head and I absolutely loved it and I thought it was fantastic so I went back and got this chat book of hers and I raced my way through it. It was very very good. Unlike her poetry collection, this one definitely is very focused on women. While it carries similar themes about immigrant women and culture and the nature of birth and all of these themes that she brings across in her poetry collection, her debut poetry collection, this one really has more of a focus on the feminine, the feminine body, relationships, romantic relationships and familial relationships that happen around women and it was fantastic. Once again she just has the best imagery, so much rhythm to her poetry and it's just so good. I did find that I wish I'd read this before reading her debut poetry collection because the gap between the two shows how much she has progressed and shows how much she's grown as a poet and improved. And even though this is fantastic, her debut poetry collection is the next level. So I kind of hurt myself by choosing to read the poetry collection before reading this chapbook. But I think if I did it the other way around, I would have loved them both equally. I just know how good she is now compared to where she's at here, which is great, but it only got better. So this was a really solid poetry collection. It's quite a short one, so you can really fly through it quickly if that's something you're looking to dip your toes into. After that, I read Maps of Our Spectacular Bodies by Maddie Mortimer. I finally finished it and I gave this book five stars. It's a new favorite and it knocked it out of the park. So this is a book all about a woman who is grieving for herself because she previously had cancer, but she overcame it and she fully recovered, but she goes to the doctor and it seems like, it looks like the cancer has come back with a vengeance. So she is struggling with this re-diagnosis and her family are struggling with having to face all of this again. And as well as that, the second perspective that you get in this book is the cancer itself. The cancer has its own perspective. And I've never read a book like that that's dealing with cancer. And oh my goodness, oh my goodness. By the end, I was a wreck of emotions. It really just hit me in the heart. I think there's something about cancer that is, you know, all illnesses are absolutely awful. But as cancer is something that I've come into contact with personally, just reading this was really harrowing. And the way you dip into not only her perspective, but her husband's and her best friend's and her daughter's perspective, you get to see how they are dealing with it and how they are struggling in different ways. And it did such a good job of showing how each of these characters, aside from the fact that they know someone who is struggling and battling with cancer, they have their own things going on. The husband is going through a midlife crisis in some ways and the younger daughter has a bully that she's trying to contend with at school and her best friend's trying to do well in her career and you get to see them trying to enact those storylines while acknowledging and focusing on the fact that they really want to be there for our main character. And our main character as, as well is facing a sense of responsibility as a mother, as someone who's really trying her best to get better, who's trying to work and all of this flooded in perfectly. It does also jump around, it jumps between the main character's present day storyline but also the main character's past where you get to see how she came to be in the family and position she is in now and there's a lot about 
the ways you live your life and if you've done the things that you want to do in your life or if you would do things differently or if you just have to accept who you are and I thought all of that was handled beautifully. In terms of the cancer perspective it was just so unique to me, I'd never read it before but also the way the cancer spoke to her and spoke to her body and the way that the words were kind of floating around the page sometimes or dripping across the page, it was just a very effective way, almost poetic in element, of how it embodied the illness. And then the end, it accumulated, it came to a boil, and that point was just everything to me. It was just the most perfect ending for this book. It's got a beautiful title, Maps of Our Spectacular Bodies, and I think that goes to show how beautiful the writing is in this one, and I wholeheartedly recommend it as one of those books that will probably make you cry if you are a crier but it is worth your time and attention. The next book that I'm gonna talk about, you all need to stop sleeping on this book. It is so good. And that is The Startup Wife by Tamima Anam. And when I read this book, I instantly gave it a five stars. There is nothing I would change about this book. This book is absolutely perfect. So this book is about Asha, our main character, and she is a programmer. She knows all the techie savvy stuff and she meets the love of her life, Cyrus, and they go on a whirlwind romance. She, her husband, and her husband's best friend, Jules, all come up with the most perfect social media app that does not exist yet. It's a startup and they decide that they are going to be three co-founders. However, it's difficult when you mix your love life and your friendships into business. And maybe somehow she's starting to see the ways in which her male co-founders are drowning out her voice. And that is what The Startup Wife is all about. I would describe this book as quirky, I would describe this book as absolutely hilarious, and I would describe it as fiercely feminist. I want to say I am so impressed with the humour in this book. I struggle with adult fiction, I don't find it to be a funny age audience to me. If I want something entertaining and it's going to make me laugh out loud, I tend to reach for middle grade and sometimes young adult. Adult fiction, not so much. But there were multiple occasions in this book where something so quirky or so oddly weird happened that I couldn't help but smile and giggle out loud and I just have to give it to this book for that because it's dealing with a very intense social topic and yet it never feels so heavy that I feel underwater or I feel drowned in the emotions but that doesn't stop it from being a strong story about feminism and women's rights and especially in a field which is known to be dominated by men. And I absolutely loved how it handled the feminist element of this book and how it handled the female representation and the way the anger you feel as a reader gradually builds as you read the book. Perfect, perfect on the nose. Because of the nature of this story, I assumed that I knew where the ending was going to go and it managed to pleasantly surprise me by bringing a lot more to the table and going in a direction that I did not expect in the slightest. And I just had such a good time with this book. I felt schooled and educated. I learned about a different culture than my own. It's got an electric cover. The paperback is just as beautiful. This is a book people need to stop sleeping on. I also had an incredibly fun wash day that ended with this hairstyle. And while I was doing that, I read The Wash Day Diaries by Jamila Rouser and Robin Smith. And this was such a delightful read. It's one of those books where I was mentally spending the time pointing at the page and then pointing at me and being like, that's me, that's me in the book. Because so much of this was such a good representation of the experience with black hair. We follow these four black women who are living in the Bronx and it's short stories focusing on each of their wash days when they wash their hair and you just dip into a slice of life story about what's going on with them. And the whole vibe of this book is very chill, it's very easygoing, it's not a very wordy graphic novel, it heavily relies on its images even though there is text as well and you just get to see these snippets of their lives and then by the last short story it all comes together, it all comes to a conclusion and you have a nice well-rounded story all in all. 
What I loved about this book was obviously the black hair representation. They all have different hair types, they all have different hairstyles, so all of their wash days look a little bit different and I just liked how it covered that. But the same thing goes for each of their stories. I love how even though all of these women we're focusing on are black women, they are all having very individual and different experiences and you can see that the ways they tackle those experiences are embedded in their culture, in the way they've grown up and what their black experience has been and it's a good reminder to people that the black experience and black people are not monolithic. We don't all have the same experience even if we might look quite similar in appearance and I just want to reiterate that with my review. The artwork and the colour palette is just stunning. I love how each story gets its own colour palette and it's all kind of purples and cool colours but each one does have its own colour group to it and the friendship of these women is just so heartwarming to see these black women be friends and celebrate themselves. I was all, I was here for it. I was so, so here for it. This was a fantastic read. And then last but not least, for something a little bit different, I read a picture book. I read I Love Me by Marvin Harrison and Diane Ewan and it was such a delightful picture book. It's a positive affirmation picture book to build confidence so within it there are lots of positive affirmations for children and they've got some lovely illustrations in there of a black family which was great and I just agreed wholeheartedly with all of these positive affirmations. I do think affirmations are a really good thing to teach children to do or to just practice with them to really get these ideas in their brain. Some of them for example are uh, I am beautiful or I know how to take care of myself or I am kind and I just liked some of the subtle messages that were in this for example in the affirmation when we were focusing on the affirmation I am strong it not only showed that they were being able to climb on climbing frames and that they were able to help out their friends a way of showing strength was also that they can rest when they're ill and they have the strength to let themselves recover and that was just something I thought was beautiful to see and then at the very end there it's got a prompt which says say it with me and then the children are encouraged to say those affirmations out loud with whoever is reading the book to them which I thought was a very nice interactive touch so if you're a parent or a teacher this is the picture book you're going to want to put in your classroom and there you have it those are all of the books that I read in June. Please let me know in the comment section down below what was the last book you read and what did you think of it. Please give this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it, hit the subscribe button if you want to see more and don't you forget to hit that notification bell to be updated every time I have a new video and you know what they say, onwards and upwards. Excelsior!